Hi guys, in this video we're going to look at Docker and how to use it for Ignition. Starting from Ignition 8.1, or it might have been 8.0, uh, Inductive Automation advertised the use of Docker in an Ignition context or environment, and I wanted to look into how it would, how it would be used and what are the specific use cases. Uh, is it worth it using Docker and using containers? I've used Docker one time in the past, so I'm by no means an expert, but I do understand um, what it is and how to use it somewhat. But this video is less about what it is and more about how to use it for Ignition specifically. First thing we need to do when uh, getting started with Docker is to install a Docker desktop. Well, install Docker on your machine. So if you're on Windows, I just Googled get Docker and uh, you'll get docker.com sites, uh, docker.com slash get started. I'm just gonna click on this link here and uh, find the download for Windows um, button. If you're running on Mac, you're obviously gonna use that download. And then if you're, if you're running Linux, you'll just need to install an engine because Docker containers run on a Linux kernel. So if you're running a Linux machine, I believe uh, you need less things to install. So I'm going to go ahead and let it install. Docker desktop, as far as I understand, uh, the last time I used it was about a year ago and they didn't have a GUI version or GUI component to Docker for Windows. I just used the command line, but as you'll see here in a second, uh, there is a GUI I guess help tool for Docker. It's kind of like MySQL Workbench. There's the command line version and there's also there's also MySQL Workbench. I meant to say MySQL. Okay, it looks like it's <coughs> it looks like it's just about done downloading here. We're going to run through the installation. We will need to reboot our machine. So let's go ahead and click on the installer. Okay, installing Docker Desktop. Okay, so if you see this window here in configuration, make sure to check this install required Windows components for WSL2. So starting from some recent version of Docker, I think 20 dot something, uh, Windows actually put out a Linux kernel, their version of the Linux kernel, so that way Docker doesn't need a VM. You don't need Hyper-V for Docker anymore, like you used to. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and keep check both of these here and click OK and wait for it to install. We're gonna have to do a few things in the control panel. But other than that, the installer is pretty straightforward. I suppose while it's installing here, we can talk about Docker, about containers in general, and uh, how they differ from virtual machines. So if you've used virtual machines in the past, they allow you to use your one host system. So for example, you can have Windows 10 or Mac OS or Linux as your host system. And then you install a piece of software called a hypervisor. So for example, a uh, Hyper-V, is an example of a Windows hypervisor, or you can use VirtualBox. I believe that's cross-platform. And then your virtual machines, they each have their own separate operating system. Not They don't use the, op, the host operating systems kernel. They each have their own uh, operating system and kernel. And they use the resources of the host machine. So you uh, typically, when you spin up a virtual machine, you dedicate a certain amount of memory and CPU cores and whatever else, disk space, to each virtual machine. They're very, I would say they're pretty resource intensive. They're slow to start up, um, but they are useful because you have an isolated, you have an isolated, isolated environment where you can test stuff out and then take a snapshot, which is basically capturing the state of the, excuse me, of the virtual machine and restore to that snapshot if anything goes awry. Um, 
Containers, on the other hand, are, are similar to virtual machines. They're more lightweight. They run, they use, uh, they run on your host operating system. So in our case, we're running Windows 10 and we're installing Docker. And the second component we're gonna install here in a second is the Windows, uh, Windows or Microsoft's, I should say, version of the Linux kernel. So now you don't need to use a, a hypervisor like Hyper-V for Docker like you had to a year ago, the last time I used it. So it should be even faster than it was back then. A container is like a lightweight virtual machine. Uh, each container has its own file system. It's also isolated. Uh, and then you can build out these containers exactly, or you build a, an image and exactly as uh, exactly how you want it. So say you want to have Python 3 and uh, MySQL and PHP, you can build out an image exactly how you want it and then package it up and you can run that same container on any other computer that can run Docker. So it's the same environment. It's kind of like a virtual env environment for Python. I don't know why I'm tripping over my words. So it's a lot more lightweight. Uh, they're a lot faster um, and they usually use the Linux kernel. So that is a, an important component. We're going to install the Linux kernel. That is why, uh, if you remember a few seconds ago, if you're running Docker on Linux, you don't need to install as much software because you're already using the Linux kernel anyway. I'm not sure if that was a clear example, but let's go back to our install here and it looks like it succeeded. Let's close. Uh, it's going to start up the Docker process or service. I think we have a desktop icon. So let's go ahead and click on that, double click, and wait for it to start up. It can take a while, but you should see. Um, if you, Okay, here's what I was talking about. WSL2 installation is incomplete. This is uh, Microsoft's version of the Linux kernel that is specifically for Docker. I believe it's specifically for Docker. It can have other uses, but go ahead and click this link that it gives you. Um, it'll direct you to Microsoft's site. And somewhere on this page here, <laughs> okay, here's the download, uh, MSI, I believe. Yeah, MSI file. Let's go ahead and click this. I downloaded it before. And let's run through the setup. Okay, hit finish, and that should be it. After this, um, after downloading that, I'll, leak, I'll leave a link to this page in the description of this video. After running that, let's hit restart, and it's going to install the Linux kernel, I believe. It needs to restart, basically. So let's go ahead and do that, and I will see you here in a minute after my computer restarts. Okay, maybe it didn't require a restart for me. Um, maybe it's because I installed Docker desktop yesterday, but I uninstalled it today before this video. So, but I did have to restart the first time I did it, and then I still might have to. I'm not sure. I'm gonna change my privacy settings because I always do. I don't want to send any usage statistics. I also don't want to start it on on. Uh, on Windows login. Okay, here is what you should see on Windows after you install Docker Desktop. So if you open a command line, um, so this is command prompt on Windows. You can also run uh, Bash if you have that installed from the Git tutorial. Um, if you run Docker version, It'll show you your client and your server versions. So 20.10.6 was the newest version, and that is what we installed. If you can run Docker version and see these messages here, both the client and the server versions, then you successfully installed Docker. Okay, let's move on to the next part. Let's actually clone, or let's, let's find Inductive Automation's Docker image 
and uh, pull it to our machine and create a container from that image. An image is like, in object-oriented terms, is like a class, and a container is an instance of that class or an object. I believe those are accurate terms. I don't remember from my college degree. So an image is just what it sounds like. It's an image, it's a blueprint, and a container is an instance of that image. Okay, so now that we have Docker installed, let's go ahead and go to a website called Docker Hub. Docker Hub is to Docker at what GitHub is to Git. It's just a repository of people's uh, Docker images. If you go to Docker Hub, I can show you um, what it looks like here. Let me go to Docker Hub. Docker Hub. <coughs> Hub.docker.com. And you're going to have to sign up for an account. I did. Let me remember my sign in, my login information. Uh, if you don't have a login, you should sign up for one now. Uh, you'll be able to upload your images to Docker Hub so that other people can use them. And you can also pull other people's images. So as you can see here, if you need a lightweight or if you need an Ubuntu container, you can pull from the official Ubuntu container or a MariaDB database. If you need a container that has, um, for example, the LAMP stack pre-installed, you can find, find it on Docker Hub. Enough blabbing, let me log in. I need to find my credentials and uh, show you what Docker Hub looks like when you have an account and when you're logged in. All right, so here's what Docker Hub looks like. Once you sign up for an account and then sign in, uh, you'll see these same images and you can also search for images. So if you search for the LAMP stack, um, LAMP, if you search long enough, you will be able to find the lamp stab, the lamp, um, a lamp image here, maybe. So what are you getting with this container? This is an example. We're not going to install the lamp stack. If you don't know what the lamp stack is, uh, it is Apache, MySQL, PHP, and uh, Linux. Sorry, I forgot what the L stood for. I believe those are correct. Uh, it's a traditional, very popular stack for web development back maybe 10 years ago. It was very popular. I'm not sure how it is now. That's just an example, though. We're not going to install the LAMP stack. Let's search for inductive automation. Uh, I believe. There we go. And we can see that 19 hours ago, their image was updated. Let's go ahead and click on it. It should have instructions how to install it how to pull it, I should say. So Docker pull is similar to cloning a repository in GitHub. Uh, let's go ahead and copy this command here. Go to either the command prompt or you can use the GUI version and uh, remote repositories. So once you create a Docker Hub account, you can sign in here so I'm going to do that now. Okay, and now we can search. Um, we should be able to search for images. I have not found here a way how to do that. Maybe not. I'm, I've not used the the <clears throat> GUI version of Docker Desktop. Let's just do it through the command line. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's good to know the command line anyway. So let's paste docker pull inductive automation slash ignition uh, and run it. It's going to use the latest, the latest version. If you want to target a specific version, you should be able to find it on... So here's tags, and you can find 
different versions. So the nightly, you have latest 8.1, and then you have different versions. So you can target a specific version. And uh, uh, let, let me see where the command is. <coughs> there you go. So if you want 8.1.5, you can copy this command here and have 8.1.5 as the version. We're going to use the latest. Uh, this will probably have some minor updates. It's probably Ignition 815. We can check here. So it's going to download all the necessary components uh, for our for the image, and then we're going to spin up a container once this is done downloading. All right. So you can see that um, the Docker image was downloaded. It was about one and a half gigabytes. Um, so to draw a comparison once again to a virtual machine, if you wanted to set up an ignition server, you need, um, if you go to inductive automations, let's actually go there and look at their requirements. I believe if you scroll down to the bottom, <coughs> um, there should be a way to see what the requirements are. Uh, learn more. Oh, it should be download. Download Ignition here. System requirements. Okay. For example, you need a very, you need a specific version of Windows Server. Uh, so you need a specific operating system. Sorry. I don't know why I said that. You need a dual core processor. You need four gigs of RAM, 10 gigabytes hard drive space. The entire Linux image or the entire Ignition image from Docker Hub was one and a half gigabytes. So you, you, can, you can tell, you can see the difference in size um, there as well. So let's go ahead and go back to the command line here. If you go back to Docker Hub, actually you'll see the command. You'll see the command uh, you can run to spin up a container. So what we downloaded was not a container, it was an image. An image is just a blueprint. So we need to actually run a command to create a container. A, cre a container is what's similar to a virtual machine, like we spoke about earlier. Okay, once we pulled this image from Docker Hub, we actually didn't really need to do this step as I just found out. Let's run, let's go ahead and run this command you can see um, what the different flags mean here. So dash n is a gateway name, not very important for us. And then these are just ports and addresses. Dash dash rm removes a container once it's stopped. Dash d is uh, runs the container in detached mode. You can look up what that means. Dash p maps port from maps ports from the container. Uh, so con this is the container port here, and it maps this container port to this port on our machine. So you'll see how that works here. Dash dash name is just the name of the uh, container. And then our image here, we're going to remove the nightly tag since we already downloaded the image. Uh, name is the gateway name, it's Docker test, and then the rest of the ports. So let's go ahead and copy this and modify it a bit before we run it. Let's paste it into our command prompt and remove the nightly tag, um, even though that's what we downloaded, but it's going to try to download that image again. Let's go ahead and run this command and it returns an ID, I believe, if you run the command docker container ls, you will see the container here and also its ID. Uh, the image it used. So this is the image we got from Docker Hub. Um, and then the name of the image test what ports are mapped to what. Uh, so here's the test. Here's the neat part. You go in your browser and go to localhost and then go to 9088. Remember that's the port that was forwarding from our container, so 9088, you will be able to see the installation or uh, 
yeah, the installation of the installation on the Docker container, and then we can go through the installation we want, and we will have a Docker gateway. Uh, you might not be convinced. You may think I, ha I have another version of the Ignition software platform server installed. Let's go ahead and stop this um, container. And since we have this dash dash rm flag, it'll remove it for us right away. So if we go docker container stop and then specify the first few characters of the ID, uh, it'll, okay, and there we go. We have the ID we entered. And if you do docker container, container ls, we can see that there's no container there because it was removed after we stopped it. Okay, let me go back here. And if I refresh this, it's going to time out because it was running from the container. Let's go ahead and run that command once again. And we have a different ID. If we do docker container ls, we see some information once again, a new ID, container ID, and then we once again have our web page here. So if you want to, you can play around. Obviously, you didn't need my permission. Uh, but something more useful would be to remove this dash dash rm flag. That way you can stop the container and start it back up again, and it doesn't get deleted, for example. You can also connect to uh, the Docker containers file system. So it's like a, uh, it's like connecting to a Linux server using SSH. It's similar to that. It opens a terminal and then you can browse around the file system. You can even install other components on the container and then package it up and push it up to Docker Hub as your own custom Docker image. That is about all I wanted to cover. So this is uh, hopefully part one in a multi-part series. The last thing I wanted to say was uh, my own opinion on Docker and Ignition and whether it's useful. Uh, you may think that inductive automation is just jumping on the bandwagon and trying to adopt whatever trends are popular in the web development community today. But I do think that Dockers and containers uh, do have a place, specifically if you're developing um, software, if you're developing applications, and you want to be able to quickly test what your container will do, the beha its behavior um, across different versions, say, of Ignition. You can have containers for Ignition 8.15, 8.14, 8.13, and so on, or even 8.0. And then you can test your software, whether it runs on these versions. You can test different databases if you want to see, if you want to create a script that will uh, create tables, for example, for, for Postgres or, or MySQL or uh, MariaDB or any other database. You can also have Docker containers. You spin it up, test it out, and uh, it's a very lightweight, lightweight way to test uh, your development, whatever you're doing in Ignition. So those are the, the common uses I, I thought of. Uh, where I work, we don't use Docker. Um, however, we are looking to move in that direction uh, to make our development process a bit smoother. Uh, that way we don't ship um, code that we're still testing to production, which is how we do it now. We test, um, we do preliminary testing, but of course we don't find all the bugs because it's impossible. So setting up Docker and having containers uh, where your quality people or you can test uh, different features and whatever else your Ignition server is doing is very handy to test those features quickly and spin them up and have a consistent environment. So you can be working on something from home uh, and then you may want to have the exact same uh, container at work. Well, you can do that. So it gives, um, in my opinion, the power of Docker for Ignition is in the development of the applications. Of course, you can also set up um, Docker containers and then there's Docker networking where these containers can communicate with each other and can communicate with the host computer and with the network that the host computer 
is on. So you can set up your entire ignition server on a Docker container and run it that way. So it's up to you how you run it. I just wanted to show um, how to install Docker, how to run a few simple commands, and then how to see uh, how to see what the Docker container is actually doing by opening it in the browser, and then you have the, the default installation of Ignition that we would go through. So that is it from me for this video. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below or on Discord. But that is all. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.